Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to... <laughs> I'm tripping on uh, Christiane's screen. I don't know if you noticed. She has, she has a cat that's like half an inch from the... <laughs> Just looks like uh, she's being overtaken. Someone sent her help. Um, so let me try this again. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the main object big book study of Alcoholics Anonymous. I am an alcoholic. My name is David. Um, hope you're all doing well. And uh, to start us out this morning, um, our friend Anthony is going to read the AA preamble. Let me just bring that up for you, Anthony. There we go. Good morning, family. Anthony O. Alcoholic. This is the AA preamble. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of people who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect, denomination, politics, organization, or institution does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. Thank you, David. Thank you, Anthony. And um, so a couple quick announcements um, before I do uh, the regular uh, stuff. Um, I, I announced this last week, but in case somebody wasn't here, um, just for logistics, um, the, uh, and to to avoid any confusion um, with my other various and sundry projects I do in meetings, AA related projects. I mean, the name of the meeting is actually going to be changing um, starting uh, December first uh, Sunday, I guess, in December, which is the third. So, since the um, Everything started with the conscious contact uh, meditation meeting and the texting service sort of labels everything with that. I am um, just switching the name to, uh, so instead of main object, it'll be conscious contact. But uh, <laughs> I will say that the, the quality and consistency will remain the same. So that's either a good thing or a bad thing, depending upon how others see my efforts. So um, in addition, um, also uh, this evening at 6 p.m., um, we are going, I sent out a, a text or a reminder for those of you who are involved in the prayer list, we're going to have a... Um, another uh, gathering um, this evening, like 30 minutes, we get together and just sort of fellowship a little bit. And it's not an AA meeting, um, but if anybody wants to join, just let me know and I'll put the, I'll put the information uh, later on in the chat. And um, so that said, um, back to uh, us, we are a line by line uh, big book study, as most people know, and the purpose, of course, is to unlock the power of the big book so that we can use it as a uh, powerful tool in our own recovery, but I think um, probably, maybe even more importantly, um, use it as a tool to guide other people through this process. And one of the things that we do, in, a, in addition to analyzing the text very closely, or when we analyze the text very closely, what we do is we categorize um, the text into five different categories um, because what we find or what I found is that as Bill um, is writing the book he really kind of writes things in one of five categories um, questions um, directions and explanations promises warnings and or history and um, the colors, of course, are the highlighter colors that I use, and it just really unlocks the book for me and really kind of turns it into um, a resource that, um, quite frankly, eluded me uh, for years, so for decades. So um, hopefully I'll help some of you uh, 
shorten the learning curve that I went through. Our format today is that uh, I'm going to share until about 7 or so, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussions. Uh, my sharing part is going to be recorded. It is recorded, and so then what we will do is... Um, uh, post that, sorry, <laughs> mental blank spot. We post it on our uh, YouTube website and that, that info will be posted as well. And um, uh, I guess uh, juggling everything at once, I, um, I, uh, I absolutely cannot remember. Did we say the serenity prayer yet or do we need to say it? We need to say it, okay, join me. For the alcoholic who's still suffering in and out of the rooms, followed by the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Okay, as I said earlier, we are on uh, page 67 of our big books, and we are in the middle of the page where um, Bill says, referring to our list again, he was um, on, on uh, two pages prior, um, we see we laid out the list with the columns about um, Mr. Brown and Mrs. Jones and the employer and so forth. And um, then he talked uh, a little bit more deeply about um, resentments. And um, what he did, is, especially in the section we read last week, uh, Bill really helped us to see how the harms that we have caused others and, the, and our resentments um, are far greater, you know, so it says elsewhere in the book, the idea that we're like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. And I think it goes that way with, um, these ha habits or the, the resentments rather. And, um, because they're much more than bad habits or poor manners, uh, for us, these actions and attitudes are, in truth, the destructive products of our spiritual malady. They really get to the heart of the spiritual disconnection that we um, move through life with. Uh, in addition, this same pattern uh, also applies, as he points out, to the harms that others have caused us. So, he makes the case that... Um, just like us, those people who have caused us harm have been spiritually sick. Now, rather than just leave it there, Bill gives us a course of action and makes it very clear that if we're to recover from our alcoholism, we have to treat the people who have harmed us with the same understanding and compassion we would wish to be treated with. And, um, and we need to take action based on a genuine desire. Or I don't know if it's genuine, but um, it may not be genuine in some cases, but <laughs> there needs to be um, a focused desire to be helpful. Um, and as Bill makes plain, uh, this approach to be helpful allows us to take the focus off of others' wrongdoings in order so that we can look squarely at our own wrongdoings. And in each instance, we're directed to determine where we have been either selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened. And we're going to go a little bit in, in depth into that today as well. Um, and this matter of being frightened or fear is an important one, for Bill instructs us that fear gets to the heart of our turning away from God. And instead, we place our main reliance upon ourselves. And to help us be free of this, Bill now directs us to put our fears down on paper and closely examine each one. And once free of these destructive fears, we're finally able to rely on God and soberly meet the challenges he places before us. And so again, as I said, um, page 67, 
Bill's now going to direct us back to the list. Remember that I said when we were laying it out, the list out, um, in the book, on page, I guess, 65, it's laid out with three columns, but I said, um, make, make space for a fourth column. And I said we would get to the reason for that in a little bit, and, and this is where we are now. So putting out of our minds the wrong, and, and these first two sentences are instruction or direction. Um, referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely look for our own mistakes. Huge question. And this is what we are using column four. Uh, this is the purpose of column four. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, or frightened? And then what we do with column four is for each resentment we have listed, we look more closely. So in column three, we are talking about the areas that are affected, sex relations, self-esteem, security, so forth. But now we're getting much closer to the exact nature of our wrongs. And I think we need to clarify too, because this, these four areas, um, selfish, selfishness, dishonesty, self-seeking, and fear, um, needed some clarification. I think, or they're they're, they're they just they justify clarification because, um, especially self-seeking and selfishness are. Um, it's confusing. They sound about the same. And so I did a little exploration, and um, and some of this is posted in the meeting chat, but I want to um, go into this a little bit more in depth. So where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? So selfish. Um Selfishness is centered on a uh, desire. So what did I desire? What did I want? And dishonesty, I think that's, that's a bit more self-evident. What lie or rationalization did I tell myself or others? Now, self-seeking. What did I do to reach my desire? So the difference between selfishness and self-seeking is selfishness is a desire, an impulse, a thought. Self-seeking is the manipulative actions that we took in order to reach our desire. I hope that makes sense. So, and then of course, frightened. What was I afraid of? So what we're looking at is, what was I desiring, in column four, what was I desiring, what did I want? What lie or rationalization did I tell myself or others? What did I do to get my desire? And what was I afraid of? So, and we're going to come back to, to fear a little bit more closely in a moment. But those situation, and, and so I'm, I'm back on page 67 um, with explanation. Those situation had not entirely been our fault. We tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where, and this is a question, so it's orange, where were we to blame? 
Like one of the things, and if you've heard me share my story, I've talked about this. I mean, I was raised in a, um, a pretty uh, uh, emotionally abusive environment. Okay. Um, however, and, and there are a lot of parts and, and moving pieces of that you would say, it's just unfortunate that this happened. However, um, I can tell you I um, moved through life with a capital V on my chest for victim. And, um, and uh, well, probably VS. Um, victim and then underneath the S, or maybe even above it, um, underneath the V was S for superior meaning I would never do to you or never think towards you what was done and thought towards me. So I became like um, uh, the king of um, uh, moral behavior, so I thought. Uh, anyway, but my part was in that situation was um, how uh, self-centered I became, how superior I became, and how poorly I treated my mother, especially later in life. My, um, my attempts at retaliation. So anyway, the inventory was ours, not the other man's. This is more explanation. And it's explanation throughout the, um, or direction uh, to the end of the paragraph. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. And this is all part of our columns. So this is under the resentment inventory. Now we're going to go a little bit more closely into fear. Notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Mrs. Jones, the employer, and the wife. And the presumption there, in case it's not evident, the presumption there is that um, our friend who's filling out this inventory for himself is admitting that uh, even though he still he may still be blaming some of these people, he's recognizing that he had fear around or underneath each of these resentments. Now, here's an interesting thing, and I think it, it really takes a little, it, it's, it's worth a little bit of closer examination. This short word somehow touches upon every aspect of our lives. Let's hit the pause button there for a second and just almost meditate upon that sentence. This short word, somehow, we may not know, we may not see, but somehow it touches about every aspect of our lives. That means that fear isn't just this narrow slice of the pie of our, you know, like a pie chart. It's not a narrow slice of the pie of our experience nearly every, if not every, experience we have, what Bill's telling us, if we are alcoholic, that is, okay? If we are alcoholic, nearly every experience we have is somehow touched by fear. Remember that he tells us elsewhere that we're driven by a hundred forms of fear. So I think this is along the same lines, but it's a little bit more direct. But what that, does that tell me? That tells me that especially when I am in a um, 
uh, situation where there may be um, uh, conflict or difficulty or um, I have a problem with someone or I have some reaction that there's a 99.9% .9 chance that in addition to any other character defects that may be involved, fear is there as well. So this short word somehow touches about every aspect of our lives. Now, the next um, two sentences are warnings. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstance which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. Now, I, I want to focus actually on the second sentence first, and then we're going to come back to the first. It set in motion trains of circumstance we, uh, it, trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. One of the skills that I had to develop is, um, it's almost like that TV show CSI, where they, um, you know, there's a crime and they, they break it down and they examine and they figure out exactly what happened every step along the way in order to get to the disaster that they find at the beginning of the show. And... So I, in order to be a sober alcoholic, I had to develop almost CSI skills with every um, conflict, disagreement, disruption, um, any emotional uh, discomfort. Because what I had to do is, when it says it set in motion trains of circumstance which brought us misfortune, the image I get, you know, when they talk about a train, they talk about the, you think about a train, separate cars that are linked together in order to get to a destination. And that's how my fear is. And what I notice is because what I do is I have a fear and I react to it because I want to quiet that fear. I want to be rid of fear. So what do I do? Well, I say something or I do something or I avoid something and then somebody else or something else has a reaction to that. And then I in turn, which is another, their reaction is another car on the train. And then what do I do? I react to that and which is another car. And so when you see one of those trains that have like a hundred cars, it's like a hundred reactions between myself and the people around me. Now, it's telling me I can't do anything about their reactions, but I can do a whole lot about mine. And of course, when they react to my actions, I totally disconnect that from what I may have done or said previously in order to set the ball in motion. So suddenly, I'm telling you about what they did to me, right? Which is fine, except that's as far, right? That's as far as I went. It's, it's almost like I become an expert in setting up and toppling large arrays of dominoes. But when I tell you about it, there's only one domino you hear about. And that's the one that fell on me. So let's jump back for a second. Fear, an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. I typically revere everything in this book, okay? Um, and it's not that I'm going to disagree with what Bill just wrote there. It's that 
because I'm thinking um, if you look at fear in the conventional, almost theological sense, I'm going to say, you know, almost like a sp part of a spiritual illness, you could say it is evil because it is not of God. However, as I don't even have to counter or refute this because we'll let Bill do that himself because what he did then in 19, and we're, I'm going to show you this, in 1962, and I guess what I'm saying is that statement tends to become in some, in some circles a sledgehammer that alcoholics sometimes get hit with by other maybe well-meaning alcoholics who are trying to help them with their fear. And what it can end up doing is shutting people down and causing you to just become defensive and not look at the underlying source. And I think Bill recognized this because back in 1962, and I think I put a link in the chat, he wrote a article for the grapevine and he talks about fear. And if you haven't seen this article, I would highly, highly recommend it. This, he talks about in the opening paragraph right there, fear is an evil and corroding thread. And, you know, there he is saying it right there. But look at what he says in the next paragraph. This is a severe indictment, and it was possibly, and it is possibly too sweeping. For all its usual destructiveness, we have found that fear can be the starting point for better things. Fear can be a stepping stone to prudence and to a decent respect for others. It can be a point, it can point the path to justice as well as to hate. And the more we have of respect and justice, the more we shall begin to find the love which can suffer much, yet be freely given. So fear need not always be destructive because the lessons of its consequences can lead us to positive values. I think one of the things he points out, so he's not necessarily contradicting that, but he's enlarging his perspective on it, which I think is important because he's saying, yes, fear is not of God. However, God can use everything, including our fears, as a pathway for healing. And so in that respect, we should avoid the severe indictments. And moving onward. So... Here we go, back to um, David's uh, domino example. Did not we ourselves set the ball rolling? And I think uh, that gets to the point I made previously. And that's a question, of course. And then we're back to a warning for the end of the paragraph and on to page 68. Sometimes we think fear ought to be classed with stealing. It seems to cause more trouble. And again, that gets back to the points that Bill then, I won't say countered, but expanded upon in the 1962 article. But here's more importantly, and, and we'll end with this paragraph. We reviewed our fears thoroughly. Now, he doesn't come out and say this, but just for clarification purposes. So, we touch upon fear in the resentment inventory. However, now it's time to do the fear inventory, which is a separate document. Because what are we doing? Yes, we're referencing our fears in the resentment inventory, but we are reviewing them thoroughly in the fear inventory. So this is direction. We reviewed our th fears thoroughly. We put them on paper, though no resent we had no resentment in connection with them. 
And then we have two, two basic, two questions. We asked ourselves why we had them. Wasn't it because self-reliance failed us? Now, just for clarification, he's not saying, he's not saying that um, um, in this instance, self-reliance just didn't happen to work. He's saying, he says later, it's self-reliance was as good as far as it went. But what he's saying is that usually what we find is that self-reliance fails us. Because what he does now is rather than allow us to dwell and ruminate on our reasons or rationale for fear, he gets to the heart of the matter. And the heart of fear being an intricate, like a central core in our spiritual malady. Self-reliance was good as far as it went. And the rest of this paragraph, and we'll end here, is warning. Self-reliance was good as far as it went, but it didn't go far enough. Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was even worse. And what we'll then do is next week, we will talk about the spiritual dimensions of fear and what we do with that. So with that, what I want to do is um, bring my portion to a close and um, now we'll open it up for um, some comments or thoughts on uh, fear and um, spirituality. So.